And when you said that, it just was like, pow. I said, life's actually been better in the last few weeks than it has been for a long while. I feel like the choice to focus on my work again has initiated major changes in my life. You say, it's so funny. It's so funny you would say this. Seriously, I have so much to say about how that simple notion is deeply meaningful in the realm of sync. Seriously, we should talk about that. Could make for an interesting AR if you'd be up for that. But I'm totally on the same page right now. I really think simple choices like committing to the necessary efforts to realize your ambitions, especially those ambitions involve sync and interconnectedness and whatnot, literally amplifies the tendency for positive syncs to just start flowing. The challenge is to not let them cause you to revert to other appetites slash desires that bring back into a funk. I myself am only just barely digging myself out of it, still in progress. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great place to kind of start. Absolutely. So what's, you know, what's, um, take, take that from anywhere you'd like, either the, uh, the tendency to, to, to slip into other, like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to start with the negative, but I'm, if, if you're willing to talk about it, I was curious, what did you sort of mean by the, the tendencies to let that slip into something else? Well, I mean, I think that, I think that, you know, uh, it can be very easy. Um, I mean, not long after, I guess, let me, let me, let me gather my thoughts here, but I think, you know, not long after I met you, which was, which is now almost exactly two years ago, it was April, I think, 2015, when I just randomly emailed you guys. Because I think I had seen, um, I think I've told you this story before, but basically like six months prior to that, uh, I had kind of this minor meltdown where I got very overwhelmed by what felt like I was being one of, one of the people that now we know actually, we know this actually happened where like Facebook was deliberately manipulating people's uh, feeds by either you know with with either overly positive or overly negative content and as a kind of experiment and that they're always up to and uh you know i was just getting i was i was overwhelmed by what was feeling like i mean i won't dwell on this but you know it was feeling like i was it was just a, this extremely uh uh disparate kind of emotional roller coaster like from one thing to the next was either like really horrible news or really good news or really irrelevant news. And, and just, I just came to a point where I'm like, fuck this. And I made this big exit and suddenly found all this time on my hands and decided to reopen uh, my research into, into the kind of more conceptual theories I had about Frank Zappa that I had done many, many years prior, which led me into this rabbit hole that all, that ulti- that uh, resulted in my first big kind of psychotic episode <laughs> that happened back in 2002. And uh, so here I was again, and, and you know, a dozen or so years later, to, it, what felt like it had taken me two years of research, I was able to kind of uh, revisit and get caught up on in literally two days just because of how much more robust the internet had become in all of that time past. And it led me way past the realm of Zappa into just all of these interesting territories. And then I stumbled upon, I think maybe one of Joe Alexander's video and brought me to the sync book, you know, and, and the rest is history. But, uh, when I was, and then I, I was very inspired by what you guys were doing because I felt like it was, it was it was a nice balance of very kind of well alternative and speculative uh, thinking, incorporating the esoteric with the mainstream in a really intriguing way that I liked, and but also kind of was less um, how do I put this. There was a lot less of the kind of new age uh, trappings that typically 
uh, deter me from that kind of material. Um, and, and I just, I just felt like it was a great balance of all of the right stuff. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so I, and, and then I was super inspired to do fine, just fine. And I think that, and, and literally, I mean, I, I don't know if I, you know, I told you that this happened. I mean, it wasn't long after I published the first couple of episodes that I had another episode of my own where I was hospitalized. And, and I think that that is kind of what I was getting at and what I messaged you earlier is that you can almost, what I now know is referred to as kind of like a sink storm or whatever, but where you kind of unlock these fundamental truths, at least based on your own particular point of view that makes sense to you and everybody else has their own version of this. But once those are unlocked, it kind of opens up this new mode of perception and just like I did when I was younger, back in twenty in 2002, I became overwhelmed with this desire or sense of purpose where I had to kind of very explicitly share what I knew and convince people that this was happening and go out of my way to examine this stuff very in, very, in ways that would get me into some pretty weird situations or or cause me to behave in ways that quote unquote normal people would find very odd and and i think that in essence it was it was just this what i'm talking about like i think it can be it happens to a lot of people once um once you tap into this kind of uh this invisible realm that i still very much believe exists um, it can become, it can really just set you on this misguided path and, uh, where that can be very dangerous for the person in terms of their mental health. And, and sometimes people actually do things that are really dangerous to others too. Um, but I, I think that once you're, once you have that type of experience and open up that new type of perception, you become very fragile and it's almost as if like the universe is really testing you. And it's like what I asked you before. It's like, have you had these moments of enlightenment only to find that you squandered these newfound abilities or, or perceptions or understanding of the way things really are. And I felt like, you know, it was really hard for me I just, it, it took a long time for me to recover and I'm still kind of recovering in a lot of ways from that. Um, and, but it's not only that, I mean, I think now also, you know, I mean, I make a living as a content creator, you know, I crank out audio content for, for multimedia and games and stuff like that. And my, my artistic career has been someone who creates content and is solely dependent on these new streaming and digital services to to have any presence in the marketplace and i just got to the point where like i can't keep i can't find a reason to keep contributing to this completely flooded oversaturated uh space anymore like when it's just going to get lost in whatever the opposite of a vacuum is it's almost like you know like, I don't, you know, and so I'm still at this point. Where right. The, the streets are flooded and and there's, you know, the, 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 the water is raging down the middle of the street and you, you go outside and take your bucket of water and throw it into the river. And yeah, and I can't you know, I, it feel it feels me- meaningless in the moment. And I I think that was part of uh, this. Is, uh, sorry, I'm just, there's a lot I want to respond to here, but I sure go ahead. I sim- okay, I, so I'm just, I think I can make this really concise is to say that last point is I have massive sympathy for that, especially, um, you know, what was it, uh, like a year and a half ago? When was that? Uh, yeah, I guess it was October 2015. Was that Joe Alexander uh, video goes viral because of the uh, Back to the Future Day, right? Yep. And suddenly we get you know, massive sort of, 
Exposure. Well, exposure, but it's blip, and it's that's the thing. It's like boom, a ton of traffic. He's saying he got you know at this point he's over two million views on YouTube or whatever it is, but half the comments are like, "You're fucking crazy. You're retarded. You have too much time on your hands. Right. You know, dumb." But whatever, like yeah, a this lot is of meaningless. You that's know, that's in keeping with a lot of the re, the sure. reactions I get from people who are close friends of mine when I tried to. Well, get right. Them. So it's easy. It's easy to sort of dismiss the YouTube comment section as Im, immature or, or or just sort of this um, filterless id of, of of the internet. But at the same time. Um, as you said, showing it to having these conversations with people whose opinions you trust and you, that you expect a more rational conversation to come out of it is often just as frustrating. Um, and there was something for me about that moment. Again, I was never looking for uh, you know fame or fortune, but it was something about working with the idea that like something's going to come we just need to get these ideas out there and I felt strongly like about these are you know this is something I just want to put out into the world and whatever Mm -hmm. and to see like it got some exposure only to be kind of like dismissed as and again maybe it's it was the nature of that video like or the or the the reception in the sense that it was a viral video so what happens with that you're a Everyone pays attention to it for a day, and then it's gone. It goes back into yeah. there on to the next thing. The next day, it's some panda bear getting kicked in the nuts, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, internet completely moves on. And there was just something really frustrating about that situation. I yeah. think because I believe so strongly in the value of what we were doing, more than just trying to create like a funny internet video or anything like that. I. So there was something really frustrating in that after working so hard for so many years yep. and Dude, combined with all the other shit that's happened in my life, particularly in the, and, and you know, it's something interesting you mentioned, uh, what, you know what today is, uh, Oh, today's actually three twenty two. That's funny. Uh, why is that funny when, to you? I'm curious. Why do I find that funny? Yeah. Cause I had my own thoughts on that, but Oh, whatever. Like, Skull and Bones and oh yeah um, okay well what, whatever just like there's a whole slew of um, Equinox and uh, whatever mm-hmm. um, I, I but I just want to say do you, do you remember we were in Boise a year ago this week oh wow yeah yeah we we met in person almost exactly one year ago uh huh um. So that's that's interesting, but so since well, since then, I mean that was sort of the the twist of the, the that was jackknife a... of my life. Uh huh. No, um, I, remember, I remember. Um, you know, all these the ambition for me was something where it was like, well, what I could keep convincing myself this was worth doing because I just want I just. Once people see this, you know, we're just some in the corner of the internet somewhere, and once people see it, then they'll get it. And then a bunch of people saw it, and they didn't get it. And then my life was falling apart, and it was, like, really hard to kind of keep motivated. Yeah. And uh, so, but what I've discovered in just the last few months that I've become re-inspired is... It's nice because taking that much time away, all that quote unquote ambition for those, like all those reasonings, uh, ideas are kind of gone. Mm -hmm. And it's just for me at this point, yeah, so you're saying the dangerous thing that happens when you drop all your sort of mental filters or you you embrace the, the abyss and there's this flood of schizophrenic psychedelia flooding your brain and your senses and how overwhelming that is for me the artwork or the creative content becomes the only way I know how to process it right and 
it's so cathartic and necessary for me that I realized I was, it was probably necessary that I stepped away for as long as I did. And at the same time, I realize now I'm at the point where like, yeah, I know whatever I throw into that, that river, that media saturated landscape, I don't expect to have this, um, major reverberation per se. Right. I just know I need to fucking do it for right. me, for, for my ability to process what I'm experiencing. And I think though that like, I think that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like, in, or at least in my case, you know, in the past when I have been able to really channel motivation and, 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 uh, and become really productive and do work that I'm really proud of and everything, there is this, I mean, there, I mean, it's inevitable that there will be this impact. Uh, if, if the work resonates with other people, it's, it's only a matter of time before the, the, the ripple effect or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, um, starts, starts coming back to you. And, and like you're saying, like, you feel like, now that you're you're back kind of in working mode again on what you're interested in things are opening you know good things keep happening um and i think that yeah that's that's the challenge is like recognizing or or actually like anticipating that or now with more experience it's like okay now that i'm going to actually get back into this mode i need to be prepared for the consequences which is there all there will be there will be a, res- a response to what I put out. And I need to understand and recognize when, you know, or I need to like, I need to kind of triage almost the responses and not get seduced by what, by the appearance of certain responses as being, you know, beneficial to, to me being able to, to to continue what I what I do or to or to maybe make it so that it reaches more people versus um, I need to you know or, or or like I shouldn't necessarily dismiss one response that doesn't have all of the trappings of oh this person really gets it and they're actually like further along than I am and can help me out or whatever you know some basically selfishly based uh, uh, idea of like, this is going to help me succeed more in the grand scheme of, you know, uh, the more mainstream notions of success, um, versus, oh, one random person fucking is completely has had like this really powerful response to this and sent me a fucking novel of an email about it. And I'm like, oh, I roll my eyes at it because there are nobody who can help me or whatever. And I should just but really, that's in a lot of ways. That's kind of seemed to for me at least. It seems like those are the things that matter more these days. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And I, I, I have gone through cycles of understanding that and forgetting it. It's as you said. You know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of your, your words again. You say, "Ever have this enlightening moment only to squander the insight?" Yeah. I mean, that's that is part of the insight. So I have been in a place where I'm like, eh, fuck success. Like the, there was a point where I was doing like my blog and whatever years back, you know, and I'd get these occasional emails. We started doing the podcast and starting these emails that were like really amazing. And they would be like, I'm making zero money off this. I'm a fucking, nobody's talking crazy shit on the internet. Right. And then like once a week I'd get these like really interesting emails of, hey man, you, this totally changed my perspective on whatever, or this is awesome, or it's okay, you get the scary emails of like, I'm suicidal and don't understand what the fuck's happening to me. You right. know, please yeah. help me. Yeah. You know. Um, and that's huge. These, yeah, these hugely intense personal reactions. And then, oh man, I feel like I probably lost that when, um, <sighs> yes, fucking, it's fun. Whatever, like, uh, just to talk, I don't mean this in, there's no, there's no blame game here, there's no anything, but just to talk practically is, uh, when we brought on, when was that? Like, we brought on the Marty Leeds, uh, wanted to do a show for SyncBook Radio, and he, 
you know, I'd done a few episodes. He's like, wow, doing a podcast is a lot harder than I thought. We should really be charging for this. You yeah, know? no, I, we've and, talked about this. I remember. And it was like we had a whole big dis- conversation with everybody. And then, like, we came to this conclusion, okay, we're going to institute a paid structure and all this sort of stuff. And then once we did that, you know, something changed of – Are we trying to appease a customer? Are we trying to make this marketable? Are we, what, I don't know, it's sort of, um, I'm not like, uh, I I think we should understand that there, it's, it makes sense to be compensated for work and we need, there are things like that that we need to figure out as a society or as, as artists or whatever. And at the same time, there is a perversion that takes place it, within the mind, when your perspective shifts to, oh, now I'm selling somebody a product, I have to make sure they're happy with this product, rather than I'm making this thing that excites me, and oh, it excites you too? Cool. Right. Well, uh, I think that's, that's a that's problem. Like, that's just, I feel like this taking this year off, I'm just like, I'm back in the place where I'm like, I got a pretty good job, my wife's, my wife, I have, a, I have solid ground under my feet again. I also realize that the any notions of success or any of that sort of bullshit are they're almost moot at this point. Like, what do you? Yeah. What do you, you get? You let's say you you let's say me and you got a I don't know a I'm, I'm trying to think of something a I don't even know what cable network or whatever we get a we get a, some sort of deal signed deal to do whatever. I don't know, you want to do a podcast for Sirius FM or, sure. or the Wally Sherold show on Comedy Central, whatever the fuck, right? Hey, that would be nice to get that paycheck and everything, but realistically, you could probably reach just as many people with a successful YouTube channel that you could with Comedy Central these days. Oh, absolutely. Re- re- you know, but realistically... The playing um, field has been so leveled that, I mean, there are entire demographics that get all of their content from the most you know modern sources like youtube or whatever which is why all of the traditional outlets like television networks and stuff are constantly like i mean i watch i love watching uh colbert's monologue every morning it's like a routine of mine you know, I love, I've always loved Stephen Colbert. I think he's hilarious. And I watch him on YouTube. I don't have CBS. I, don't, I mean, I live in Italy now, obviously, but I didn't have it then. I didn't have a TV. I mean, I have a TV, but I didn't have any traditional, you know, it was just hooked up to the internet. I didn't have any cable or, or even digital antenna or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> and I think that, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to dwell on this for too long because I'd love to get into some more just fun yeah. info. But, uh, but yeah, I think I, I still haven't really reconciled. But I, what, what I, what I guess is that I realize that it's, it's, it's no longer to me. It's, it's, it's no longer about. Uh, putting this sense of urgency or, or this sense of, of needing to ensure like everything I put my name on meets this certain bar of production value or whatever. It's just like, get it out. And, and there eventually there's going to be a person, a single person maybe who for one reason or another arrives at this thing that you and I or, or whoever has made, maybe even this very recording that, that they're listening to right now, hi. Um, but, and if it contains... It, we're in, in your house, we're in your ears, we're yeah, in right, your brain. Right. Yeah, but if that thing in whatever whatever quality or whatever format or whatever it happens to be in, if they're able to process it, and, 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 you know, uh, and, and understand it in a way, uh, and, and if it contains information that is relevant to whatever they're after, that's ultimately all that matters, you know? And, and some of the stuff that I have been thinking about a lot lately is just this notion of um, 
Well, I mean, or just, you know, some of the stuff that I find myself digging and, and, and digging up are like obscure articles from magazines from the 19th century, you know, about just like just happen to be have been scanned by Google Books or whatever. And I look at the stats and like zero views or whatever. But for me, it's like the holy grail of whatever topic I'm interested in that moment. And I feel and certain things I've come across have totally altered uh, or totally like very profoundly impacted my whole kind of ongoing research in ways that and for all I know they're completely wrong but they've stirred they've they've steered me into a particular direction and so be it you know and it's like it's it's almost like sometimes I'm I'm interested not to sound like a hipster music fan but the more sometimes the more obscure a thing is the more um you know the more kind of uh I don't know just there's just this intrigue kind of embedded into that. And, um, and also like, I think it also allows for authenticity. Yeah. Well, it's also the sense of, that is a hipster sort of mentality, but there, there, nonetheless, yeah, nonetheless, there's a truth in that, uh, which again can be overblown and, and perverted, uh, into, into a cliche. Sure. Uh, but it's, again, this cliche for a reason because, there is a sincere truth in it. Yeah. No, and a lot of my thinking these days, you know, and I have started to kind of, um, you know, I'm finally getting to a point where I'm able to begin to articulate at least the current state the, of the always evolving kind of my grand unified theory of everything. Uh, but, but a lot of what underpins that for me right now is this notion of what on the surface, like a lot of the things, you know, because I've always been interested in, you know, how, in, how much interest I take in just individual letters of an alphabet or, or just these seemingly trivial, totally kind of mundane everyday objects of, uh, that, we, that we rely upon to communicate. And, and to me... It's almost like the more the smaller and more reduced it is, like I don't know the letter J or whatever, you know. Take insert any random symbol you want there. But to me, I see that as something that is so full of information versus an entire an entire encyclopedia, which is a very which is which seems like it's just this vast tomb of information, but it's finite versus this tiny little thing from which you can derive endless, endless amounts of information, whether it's objectively derived as like, well, this is, was written like this in the 12th century and then it changed to this shape or whatever. You could go into this very kind of... Shape with the letter J. Yeah, exactly. Or... Uh, yeah, good example. Yeah, yeah right? Uh, versus versus um, something that is very, very specifically defined, like a novel, which is like, here it is, this is what it is. And sure, you could talk about, you know, but I'd rather say, well, let's take apart that novel and go to page 42 and, and go to the third line and for the second word of that line and look at that word and let's spend a, let's spend a day understanding everything we can about not only that word, but the letters in that word, what it translates into other languages. I mean, it just, it's just endless. And to me, I see that as this much more uh, rich source of information than, you know, uh, an entire book or whatever. But and 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 it's, it's the distinction between the uh, you the a tree a tree gets cut down and you make it into a piece of beautiful ornate furniture. Mm -hmm. But now that's what that is, right? And may and actually, you know, maybe I guess there's really actually nothing in this because even that novel or whatever, right? These things can be that furniture can be um, a, a sort of modern idea. This is upcycling, right? You take some old piece of furniture, refurbish it, turn it into something new. That can happen, of course. But essentially, it's sort of right. It's, it's it can evolve. It can still evolve, right? But you're talking about the acorn that contains the oak tree, which contains the fruit, which contains the, the nest of birds, which contains all these things, which then eventually becomes the piece of furniture that becomes the pulp for the novel, and it becomes the log for the fire, and it becomes the 
wood for the desk yep. on which the novel was written and all these sorts of things. So exactly. you're, you're trying to go back to the acorn exactly. and appreciate the, before, the fullness. And, yeah, no, before you uh, go ahead, this is really an appropriate time for me to pull up something that is that beautifully articulates this. Hold on, let me turn on a hard drive. Are you familiar with Walter Benjamin or Benjamin? No. The name I think I've heard you mention the name, but I, it does, I have no connection to it. Okay, well, actually, it's funny. In the the transcription that you sent me, I talk about the Ur phenomenon. Uh-huh. You grab uh-huh. that. So this is, uh, that's a concept that Goethe coined. Uh, and Walter Benjamin was this early, or early 20th century German literary critic. He was kind of like this guru to the Frankfurt School of philosophers who kind of worshipped him, like Theodore Adorno and uh, um, Horkheimer and a couple of these other German philosophers that came later. Um, But he was this very fascinating guy whose writing is just... His most famous essay is this thing called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And this was... He was talking about photography and like what happens when... What happens to the the ritual of art of of of, uh, of viewing a piece of art when it is no longer a unique, a one of a kind object, but something that can be massively reproduced, right? And it's this is this was written in like the 30s, um, and still has kind of very profound implications today. Uh, man, let me find this. Hannah. So there's this woman named Hannah Arendt. She is a German. Philosopher, she is most known for the book. She she was like a um, at the Nuremberg trials and wrote a whole bestseller book on her accounts of of observing the Nuremberg trials and invented or coined the phrase describing Adolf Eichmann, the banality of evil. I don't know if you've heard that in reference to uh, to the Nazis, but Eichmann was you know like the secretary, the OCD, anal retentive kind of just this guy who who had the most mundane kind of clerical position in the Third Reich and was kind of responsible for just systematically organizing like a fucking Excel spreadsheet, you know, genocide. This connects to the uh, IBM's role in the Holocaust of, uh, right, it's the the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I just reduce it to numbers. Damn it, I can't fucking find this. Actually, yeah, well, there's a movie called Hannah Arendt from a few years ago. Wow, I had no idea. Um, Where there's this collection of essays uh, by Walter Benjamin called Illuminations. And he wrote, or she wrote the the foreword. And in a lot of ways, her kind of uh, interpretation of what he was saying about the earth phenomenon and about about these very small things... um, Damn it, I can't fucking find it. Okay, here we go. Um, If you've got it in front of you, this is on page 11. Um, But here we go. He was concerned with the correlation between a street scene, a speculation on the stock exchange, a poem, a thought, with the hidden line which holds them together and enables the historian or philologist to recognize that they must all be placed in the same period. When Adorno criticized Benjamin's wide-eyed presentation of actualities, he hit the nail right on its head. This is precisely what Benjamin was doing and wanted to do. Strongly influenced by surrealism, it was the attempt to capture the portrait of history in the most insignificant representations of reality. It scraps, as it were. Benjamin had a passion for small, even minute things. Sholem tells about his ambition to get 100 lines onto the ordinary page of a notebook and about his admiration for two grains of wheat in the Jewish section of the Museum Cluny on which a kindred soul had inscribed the complete Shema Israel. For him, the size of an object was in an an inverse, inverse ratio to its significance. And this passion, far from being a whim, derived directly from the only worldview that ever had a decisive influence on him, from Goethe's conviction of the factual existence of an urphenomen, 
an archetypal phenomenon, a concrete thing to be discovered in the world of appearances in which significance and appearance, word and thing, idea and experience would coincide. The smaller the object, the more likely it seemed that it, contain, that it could contain in the most concentrated form everything else. Hence his delight that two grains of wheat should contain the entire Shema Israel, the very is essence of Judaism, tiniest essence appearing on tiniest entity, from which in both cases everything else originates that, however, in significance cannot be compared with its origin. Hopefully that was uh, right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm reading. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, I like the next one. In other words, what profoundly fascinated Benjamin from the beginning was never an idea. It was always a phenomenon. Totally. Totally. And that's, you know, it's, yeah, that's, that's fucking amazing. Yeah. I fucking just like that passage I always come back to it's like so burned in my brain as like this very uh, defining concept and and getting back to what I was saying earlier it's like to me these trivial things like letters or or just mere words or whatever or like a single word or um, the significance of I don't know just you know uh, the, the, the very subtle differences between depending on where you live, you say a particular word differently. Um, whether you're like in America, you know, if you're from the South, you have a particular twain. And in the North, you have another one, right? And all of these little things to me are, are extremely significant. And, and my whole working theory these days is centered around a lot of these things in that, you know, if there is any kind of big, larger, fundamental truth at, at play that affects all of us, uh, and if it has any sense of, if, it, if this, whatever this thing is, has uh, consciousness or awareness of the human subjects through which it is interacting and manipulating and and, 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 and basically uh, enduring and surviving, really, uh, that it would be in its best interest to maintain the most effective disguise possible, this kind of hidden reality, if you will. And, and what is more effective than something that upon, when most people virtually all people, really the vast majority of people encounter this idea that there's some kind of like really deep hidden truth hidden behind these very mundane things, it's so easily dismissed. And what better, like this whole notion of hiding in plain sight, I mean, Jesus, like, and also the, the type of research required to begin to understand what lies beneath the surface of these things is boring. It's not sexy. It's not an adventure. It's boring. And to me, like, I can't help but find that or, or feel that, like, that is, that's kind of where it's at. And that's why, like, this, this kind of circles back to what we were talking about, about our, our, our lack of motivation to be productive and to kind of keep trying to break through into this larger uh, uh, stream of, a public awareness that in itself is like just chews it up and spits it out. I mean, even if we, like you said, with the back to the future video, despite what on paper looks like a successful, huge moment of exposure amounted to very little. And, um, to me, it's like, yeah, actually this is why now I'm more motivated than ever to just kind of stick to my own instincts of what interests me. And, and if it's boring, fuck it. You know, it should yeah. be boring. It's going to be boring. And I, uh, sorry, and I just want to address something there as to the, the Back to the Future video success, right? So, like, quote unquote, success or whatever you say, was it a success or was it amount to nothing? And I just want to clarify and um, this was something um, I think Joe Alexander said in, when uh, I, think, I think in his interview with Will Morgan, um, 
like three days after the, 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 the video or something came, you know, had its, had its round. Um, he was saying like, yeah, what it, the fact that half, literally at least half of the comments are completely dismissive. So whatever this astronomical number is, you already cut that in half. Right. And then you, uh, another half of those are, I don't get it. You right. know, and you, but, but they're, but they're, they're questioning maybe. Maybe that's dismissive, maybe it's questioning, maybe it's whatever. But you keep going smaller, 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 but maybe 1% of those people got something out of it. Exactly, and that's really all that matters. Yeah, well, exactly. So to say, like, is it a success or a failure? Well, it's a success in the sense that 1% of 2 million, 3 million people, whatever the fuck it's up to at this point, I have no idea, but... 1% 1% of those people are now turned on to some... It worked for me. I mean... Crazy shit, right. I saw an earlier version of one of those videos, the longer form one that was like an hour or something from a couple of years back. And that's what led me to... that. I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it wasn't for that. And a lot of the things that I've been exposed to since meeting you and, and that in this whole community, you know... Um, and to be fair, you know, like there are aspects of uh, or there are topics and, and areas that, that um, are uh, kind of are, are talked about fondly in, in that community that that uh, I don't really gravitate towards as much. And, you know, and I admit that and it's uh, I, don't, I don't I'm not dismissive of it, but I'm I'm definitely like when I was more involved on a day-to-day basis in the sync community, I always felt like I was kind of the conservative of the bunch, you know? And I was comfortable in that position, but I definitely, like, had that sense. And, like, you know, because I definitely come from a background, uh, a, a very materialistic view of the world, and the vast majority of my close friends are, are, are very strict rationalists and... Uh, when I was getting kind of very uh, wrapped up in a lot of this stuff, they were kind of, they were raising their eyebrows and just like, uh, what is this you're getting into here, Wally? Um, you know, I don't really, I can't really, I can't really jump on this ride with you, you know? And it was, that was hard for me. Like it was, cause like, you know, it was like, but but at the same time, I mean, I think even if you were to watch like my, I mean, you've obviously seen it. Uh, you edited it beautifully, uh, the the contact presentation. I mean, there's a lot of what I talk about that's very based in in material science, and I think that, and we can we can kind of move on from this. But what one point I've well, what I one point I, I wanted to know, make finish, is finish your thought, but I don't. I, I do want to move. I just want to say I don't. I do want to move on, but I want to add to it before we move on. Okay. So, so my I guess is that. One of my largest pet peeves for it for many, many years is that there is this unfortunate, like, very clear division between kind of idealist worldviews and materialist worldviews. And I have, I could say this about any discipline or, or it's like my musical attitudes as a composer with Mirthcon and stuff it's like man it's the point in the middle where all that shit gets mixed up and there's intersections between all of those areas uh where you know the stuff that science can't explain and the stuff that 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 maybe idealist philosophy has yet to really compel compellingly articulate it's that gray area period that I find most fascinating and why there isn't more of a willingness or to say like, why does the existence of evolution negate the existence of religion per se? Or, or how is it that they're like, why can't we meet in the middle? You know, I mean, and, and like that, that informs my politics too. I'm a centrist poli- politically. Like I, I'm just like, fuck this extreme anything. Like I just have no interest in taking a fucking side if, if that's going to just be all about antagonizing an entire another group. Like either you're about unity or you're not, you know, and I'll, I'll stop there when it comes to politics. But so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like there's this middle area that forces people who take a firm stance on either side to really 
challenge their own beliefs, regardless of what those beliefs may be. And to me, that's the most interesting and rich area for, for ongoing learning and discovery. Absolutely. And I, uh, I just want to sort of a slight twist on what you're saying. Uh, I just want to share something that I've been viscerally feeling in the last uh, last few weeks. Uh, as I said, my, 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 my wife feels like it's in transition again. I feel that very strongly. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I got distracted by a work email. What was that again? Uh, I said, uh, I was saying uh, something that I felt very viscerally in the last few weeks. Uh, and, and to be clear in the last few weeks, I feel like my life is in a sort of weird major transition again, uh, as it was exactly one year ago. Um, but more positive, more so, positive in, in, than it was a year ago. Sure, yeah. Um, well, yeah. It's a you know, um, it's the ebb and flow. So a year ago, I was I transitioned into an ebb, and now I'm transitioning into a flow. Yep. You know. Yeah. Been there before. I'll probably be there again. You know, <laughs> whatever. Like it's fucking life. I you know. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is that like, uh, for okay, so. Um, I've been. In a, I don't. I don't really want to go into personal spe- specifics, but uh, so about a year ago, uh, my wife and I split up. I, I I move out. Things kind of. I just pull pull back from everything. Sink stuff. Um, pull. I just pull back from everything, and I just sort of moved to a new city. Started a job. Basically, just kept my head down and just did my job started to make some friends here in this town but these were just you know good good time friends hey hang out after work grab a drink whatever right Uh, but what I was experiencing and I really feel like I'm I knew I I, so to a certain extent for, for, for about 10 months or so I felt like this is me just avoiding all the things that I had these emotional attachments to that so defined my life for the last number of years, I sort of like felt like I needed to avoid them. And I just couldn't deal with it. I couldn't process it. I couldn't, just couldn't face it. And so for about 10 months, I was just like, okay, this is just me distracting myself. And then a few months ago, I'm sort of like, hey, I felt re-inspired, and I'm like, I think I'm ready to put my toes back into this these waters, and it became like a smack in the face, a realization of how either spoiled or that I was living in an echo chamber or whatever you want to clarify, however you want to sort of classify that or label that, that I had gotten so used to a wife who... Even though she knew I was, she thought I was crazy. <laughs> she accepted my madness, right? Yeah. And same here. And and she was there for a lot of the development of these ideas and these works, and was familiar with them enough that I, again, she definitely thought I was crazy. How long were you married? Uh, eight years. Uh huh. Uh, no, no, married. We got married in 2010. 2010. So six, so six years married. Okay. Um, I don't know. Some, some, I don't know, whatever. That's, That's when it. I got married. Uh, what's that? When I got married in 2010 also. Really? Yeah, early Jan- in January, so like right at the beginning. Uh, I got married in September of 2010. Uh, anyway, um, you, you know, like I said, so... The ability to, like, go... So even I'd go to work, but then I'd come home, and if I said some crazy shit, I'd get a smile and a nod and maybe some, like, actual feedback or conversation out of it, right? Mm -hmm. I could... My phone would be, hey, I'm going to call Wally up, or I'm going to call Doug, or I'm going to call Will, or I'll call Andras, or whatever. And I could have these conversations with people about crazy shit who, like, 
there was so many people around me that made it feel normal that I forgot how crazy it is to the outside world. Yeah. And now I'm here in this like new city. I've like I've lost contact with a lot of my friends. I'm not talking to people about all this stuff. And then I'm sort of like getting back into these head spaces yep. and I'm walking around going, Holy shit, I'm a mad like I am not like this is I forgot how how different the world out there was than it was in my mind or in my my womb of like people who made it feel normal. Yep. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, it's so funny you mentioned that because just uh, just as a quick aside, uh, I had a very similar experience just a couple weeks ago uh, having a four hour call with uh, Zenor. Um, and it was the first time for me in months and months and months I had really... Tell me you fucking recorded that, by the way. We didn't. You son of a bitch. I know, go because... Go we, on, go on, really, go on. I really, don't want really to wish we I don't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Go okay. on. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, that's really all I wanted to say is that it, it really kind of thrust me back in a, in a, in a, in a real serious way. Um, I mean, there was always the stuff kind of in the back of my mind and all the daily little little triggers that I always am dealing with now that I that I'm constantly like noticing and it's become so it's like John Nash and his and his hallucinating uh her his his imaginary best college roommate and cousin or whatever that he never stopped seeing in you know beautiful mind I have these uh there are these, you know, just little pieces of information that I'm all like that keep recurring and appearing in my life uh, every day, every hour, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, but besides from that, like I hadn't had any real conversations with anyone about this, and so yeah, I mean, I, I it being being in the thick of just all the practical logistics of moving and all this crap it really forces you just to kind of have your feet on the ground in the quote unquote real world. And as soon as you step back into this headspace, you it's, it's very easy to, to recognize, fuck man, this is like, this is a realm where very few people travel and understandably because it's, it's weird. It's, it's nerdy and it's boring at times because of the, you know, the amount of data you have to process to just grasp things. And, but yeah, I mean, Anyway, continue. <laughs> no, so when you were saying like your friends who like, and this is you're talking like a well-established friends or your 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 sort of circle of of uh, reality, you know, your 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 three dimensional like network, um, sort of raised some eyebrows. Uh, for me, it was like. I, I remember going through that years ago when I like kind of got into conspiracy shit. Mm -hmm. um, but then, like I said, I spent, I've spent so many years with this group of people that I understood that like we were all on the same page that I totally forgot what that feeling was like. And um, you know, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just sort of fascinating. And one of the things I, I, I don't. I don't I don't know if I should include this or, uh, and I sort of don't want to dwell on it, um, cause it's a new thing, but just, so this idea of, um, fo changing your focus and then the synchronicities or whatever that comes with it. So, I mean, like I said, I, in just the last two months, I've been really feeling like, okay, I'm getting re-inspired. I'm focused. I'm working on my work again. I'm getting back into these head spaces and I'm feeling sort of distant or detached from this little insular life I was building here of just a safe space of like, hey, we're going to hang out and nothing's too heavy, nothing's too deep, just just hang out, you know, whatever. And it was just yeah. safe and comfortable, allowed me time to process and heal and whatever. But I you sort built of a coming community. at you you were at the, you were at the at the I mean you were kind of the figurehead of a of a of a real community that had organically grown and I mean that's that's no easy task and that's I mean that's that's 
that's something that's significant and that you should feel proud of. But yeah, but yeah, it's also healthy that you recognize the long-term implications of that in terms of your larger relationship with the world at large, right? Oh, interesting. So what I was, um, huh, I was, uh, I'm actually thinking of it in almost the opposite terms. Oh, really? Is, um, is that like, I was in this position, I had this community, I had these friends, and I needed to, I do ultimately feel like I needed to, and I don't know how I could have gotten through the last year while still managing to do all this stuff. I, I honestly felt like it was necessary for me to take this time away. Mm -hmm. But I also do feel like I abandoned some people, some people hanging, and it's just the nature of the beast. It's like oh, yeah. I had just I had to step away, you know. Yeah. And um, I did the same thing. Yeah, you know. Uh, so yeah, I hope people forgive me. And it was just it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I walked uh, away from I walked away from MirthCon at the peak of its success. You know, yeah. And for for multiple years before I moved, all of the people involved were were basically still totally on call and willing at the drop of a hat to to jump back on duty and do whatever I wanted them to do. And I but I just and that's a very that took me years to cultivate. And I was just like, well, this is not. An it's not appropriate for me to, to utilize those resources anymore for what because I don't even know what I want to do anymore and I feel like I'd be wasting <laughs> your time you know right exactly yeah um, and they were very understanding ultimately when it when it really came to the head that this is over you know but but yeah I mean that's what happened well that's uh, it's funny so um, okay this will be another tangent but this, if we when we release this as an always record, this will be always record episode one seventy three. Oh, fuck. and for for me, oh, the, that combination of numbers, yeah, me too, is it is incredibly meaningful uh, oh. as it is. I, I, as I noticed, to Zanor and a bunch of people. It is um, to me too. So, I was holding on to this. One of the reasons there hasn't been an always recorded months is because. I wanted this to be something specific, and I had some specific ideas of what I was going to do for it, and all this sort of stuff. But then I was also had the idea that maybe since we're so close to like episode 175, and if I feel the need to take time away, maybe it's good to like come up with an ending point. You know, maybe do three more episodes, call it done, instead of just letting it. You know, better to burn out than fade away. Type yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, and I had that thought, and I was seriously, I've been considering the idea for, for months, been considering the idea of like, maybe I make an announcement here, this is always reports going to end at 175, blah, blah, blah. I, I still don't know. I haven't come to a fucking conclusion on any of this stuff. Um, I know Dave wants to keep it going. Uh, John's cool with whatever we do. <sighs> Sorry, it's sort of like, there's like, my, my mind is racing at this point. I but um, it was. Hey, take it, take take one sec, cause I need to turn off the heater in here. It's like I'm cooking. Sorry about that. It's all right. So, so go I ahead. I guess what I, if I can, if I, if I remember kind of where I was, was that. Um, and it's not your fault. That's glad I, I lost my. I, I kind of lost my train of thought in the over. I know the, the feeling. I know the feeling all too well. So I was. I think I was saying I felt kind of the opposite of needing to reconnect with reality which is true and it, that's that's an important notion and for me the like the reconnecting with society and reality was like a grounding it was like a way for me to put my feet on the ground and be like I can't I can't do this right now with my I can't face the the, the full extent of the cosmos when my world is spinning you know uh, I think that's how I would have gone fucking mad. And I needed to, like, unplug, get my head out of the sky, and just, like, crawl on the ground for a while. Um, Me too. And, uh... Absolutely. Roll around, roll around in the mud for a bit and, you know... Well, not to, not to make a stupid pun, but it sounds like we're kind of in sync. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so I felt like just recently it's sort of... As I said, as I started to get back in these headspaces, I was like, holy shit. I, f 
for the first time in years, I feel really weird. Like, I feel like I'm the, that weird guy or I'm <laughs> fucking crazy because I don't have a bunch of people around me to be like, yeah, and then blah, 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 blah. Like, oh, totally. I, just, I had the same thought or I know exactly what you mean. Instead, it's like I've become very quiet and uh, reserved and uh, I've, been, I've like my, my social skills are like really did like I, I used to be a very outgoing person, um, and I just sort of find myself very reserved and like I don't even know how to begin to talk because I just felt I'd be this weird crazy guy, and that was a realization that's hit me really hard. But I and I felt like kind of alone and um, yeah. So I, I again I don't want to put any like like weight on on this or or anything is a brand new thing and I don't I don't want to put weight on it but it's like it was literally like in this moment of being like I I don't have anyone like that that I can speak to or I mean not that I don't obviously I have you and I have like, I still have all of these friends it was just sort of like looking it around myself do you know what I mean in this rolling around the mud in this day to day world that I, I, I'm now existing in for the past year and like suddenly I just meet this girl who just like we just started talking like philosophy and art and all this sort of, and I was just like oh we should a human being that I can have a conversation with that I'm not and it was just yeah fucking mind blowing like it was just um it was a fucking saving grace honestly anyway so whatever comes that comes that doesn't fucking matter it's like Don't just enjoy the, it for the time okay, being this, right when so this is brings us back to like sort of like that initial comment that you stuck to uh, when I said, I feel like the choice to focus on my work again has initiated major changes in my life where it's like your focus becomes your reality or something. And I'm like, Hey, my, my focus and my reality or my, what I wanted to, what I was trying to get back into seemed to not jive with my reality. Mm -hmm. And it seems like my reality is sort of shifting to correspond with it, if that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. And I and the reason that it jumped out at me so much is just because I think and 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 my the reason I brought up this this question that I put to you was: Do you ever feel like you squander these powerful insights or or new you know modes of perception or whatever? Is because like one of the things that like I mentioned a little, uh, just a moment ago, that, you know, no matter how deep or, or not so deep I've been over the last year or year and a half into this way of thinking or, or just research or whatever you want to call it, there has, this been, there has been this persistent presence in my mind uh, of, of, you know, coming into contact with just little little chunks of information or or whatever that are always triggering me like oh that's um that's meaningful to me or here's that combination of letters or numbers again for the millionth time that like no matter what no matter when it i seem to look at the clock it's always a set of numbers that seems to have significance and part of me part of the more rational side of me says well Wally you've probably really broadened the criteria <laughs> for what for what constitutes a, a meaningful little <laughs> glance so you broaden that criteria so much that you let i mean that you could literally look at anything and say oh there's something there but at the same time i mean that is part of my kind of working theory is that there's something in everything because it all stems from an uh the same origin so inevitably if everything's connected then everything's connected and you have to take that at face value right but one of the things that just to get into real specifics here that happens to me specifically when i'm dealing with technology of any or like especially internet connected technology whether it's my phone or my computer um but basically like uh, and sometimes I have to remind myself that I have this kind of strong suspicion, and it's still a suspicion. I wouldn't call it a belief just yet, but 
it keep it happens enough where I can I can get into a mode where I totally believe it. Uh, but if I decide in the moment that I'm going to do something like I'm going to go to this website or I'm going to open up this file or I'm going to listen to this song or I'm going to call this person, whatever. Whenever I make a decision to just interact with this device that by its very nature is connected, speaking of all things that are connected, um, what I've noticed often happens is that I'm present like if there is in any way a hiccup or, or, or a delay to like, oh, I'm going to go read, I'm going to go load the New York Times for the 900th time today, even though I know that there's not going to be anything there that I haven't already seen or that's important enough for me to spend any time on right now. But out of because I'm such an addictive personality, I just do it because it's it's a way to pass the time instead of doing what I should be doing. And that's an important point. What I just, you know, instead of doing what I should be doing, which is very related to what you said about now that I'm back doing, you know, my work again, and I'm saying making the choice to commit to the necessary effort, right, to do what you need to do, you know in the back of your mind I should be doing this. But whenever I choose to, oh, just indulge and waste and, and really waste right, my I'll time. Scroll through Facebook again. Yeah. And if it's there's. Like, Stop that. Stop right. that motherfucker. You got shit to do. I feel like it happens to me every day where there is like a, a, a suddenly, for whatever reason, and it's totally abnormal because usually I'll, I'll log into Facebook or in the New York Times or whatever and it loads and it's there. And, and everything's fine. But if there's any kind of anomaly where it like sudden, it's like taking 10 seconds longer than usual or, or something like that, there have been times where I'm like, this is some other larger thing that is fully aware of the fact that I'm not doing what I should be doing. And it is giving me a little hint right now that, hey, you're not supposed to be doing this. So we're going to delay it for just a split second, and maybe you'll realize that when this happens, it's kind of this signal from wherever that's saying, go back to doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. And I know that, I mean, it sounds silly, but any kind of little hick, like a, a, a call doesn't go through, or, or even I click my mouse and it doesn't register, and I have to click it again even though it should totally have worked, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't in that moment. And if I am really in the zone and notice that every time it happens uh, and just say, oh, that's a sign, I need, to, I need to divert my focus back to what is really, what really matters, I do it. And, I, and if I kind of discipline myself, I'm like, anytime I hit one of these little obstructions, I'm going to take it at face value as meaning you're not supposed to be doing this right now. Get back to that, you know, you're, you're working on this other thing that you know you're supposed to be working on, but you've gotten to a point where it's really a pain in the ass to get to the next step or, you know, you, you know that it's going to be hard and you're at a point in the project where it's no longer fun, but you have to do the necessary crap. And this is our, I mean, it's, this can easily turn into just a boring lecture on the importance of discipline, but from this kind of sink head or whatever you want to call it point of view, I started interpreting these recurring little, little miniature minuscule obstacles as very real manifestations of some larger awareness that was very benevolent, benevolently saying, Hey, you're not supposed to do this right now. And in that moment, I am presented with a choice of do I ignore this and persist or do I acknowledge it and obey it? And, and well, I, So I, I want to ask, do you apply this creative, creatively as well? Like I, uh, so that video I sent you I was sort of like building a thing and then I had this like three or four minute segment that I had done like a, a 
two months ago that I did release out on, on Facebook or whatever, and I was just like, oh, let me just see if I kind of put that right up at the front, like just just because I just kind of wanted to see, you know, be able to watch ten minutes in a row just to feel some like, hey, I've accomplished something, you know? Right. But for whatever reason, there was like the file was corrupted and wouldn't load in my video player, and I tried it like three times, and I'm just like. Oh right, because I I know this doesn't belong here. Like if I use that segment, it would belong much later in the right. video. And your imp- my impatience to just see ten minutes of footage is telling me throw it in, just throw it in, dude, just throw it in. It's easy, you know. And I'm like, no, this is not meant for now. Like fucking stop. Right. Fucking However, stop. there's a there's a flip side to this, right. and there is also the moments. <laughs> oh no, yeah. Where it's like. No, like, I mean, my entire existence as when I was doing MirthCon was like, who in their right mind would, you know, put this kind of band together and, and knowing, I mean, it's so anti-commercial by, in its very nature and it's so overly complicated and I'm going way out of my way to make all of this sheet music and make it look really beautiful and, and do all of these edits on the audio that no one will notice and... Just do all of this, almost over overdoing it by most people's metrics, you know. But but choosing to say no, I'm like, oh, you don't have to do that. I'm like, fuck that. I am gonna do it, and I'm gonna bring this con- this idea that I have very clearly in my head out into the world, no matter who tries to stop me. And this is more in line with the kind of now romanticized idea of never give up, you know, and, and always, no matter what tr- you know gets in your way, you've got to keep going and perseverance and all that shit, right? And I guess what I was ex- describing earlier is in a way the more esoteric flip side of it, where it's like, no, there are times too when, when, these, when these obstacles are very healthy to honor, and 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 obey versus and so it's almost it almost gets to the point where you become where you become kind of facile and 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 have have built up this muscle mass and muscle memory of understanding when you're faced with these obstacles it's like i have a choice to make do i do i it's and, all about building discernment man yeah absolutely yeah and is it intuition discernment all these things where you figured out because yes if if you if every time you were faced with an obstacle, you're like, oh, this means it wasn't meant to be done. And I've met, within the sync community, I've met a bunch of people like that. Oh, I remember fucking years ago, like, um, one of the guys, one, some guy was like, hey, we wanted to make a web, they wanted to make a website for something. And they're like, when the time is right for us to have a website, that person will appear in our lives and build a website for us. And I'm like, yeah, uh, I'm going to go build a website. Like, have... Take care. Like, yeah, sometimes I'm not waiting. You can't wait for things to happen. You have to make yeah, them happen. Yeah, you know, I'm just like that's fucking madness. Right. But again, that's just so that's, that's part of that is my personality of like, uh, there's a task to be done. Let's just fucking do so it. So it's this but constant then, juggling right, between yeah, distinctions, right? So of course it was fucking hard. It was full of obstacles, and you per and you persevere. As I say, like, so if uh, if everyone, if every time there was an obstacle, we said that's a sign from the heavens to not proceed, then salmon would be extinct because they wouldn't swim fucking upstream. They'd be like... Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. that looks really fucking hard. I'm just going to chill down here in this bear's mouth and fuck it. You know? Right. We and don't I, have salmon anymore. I so think... there's there's that. And at the same time, if you... Uh, I don't know. If you're a, a, a salmon and you, you start to swim up a fucking tributary that leads fucking nowhere you, you you made a wrong left turn at that third rock back there and this is a fucking dead end you have to use your sermon like i don't know this is kind of narrowing out i don't think this is working maybe this ain't the right path so you know right. what i'm saying like so this just part of that is instinct part of that is discernment and it's i do believe it's building a muscle it's building a um uh, uh it's it's funny because I've used this the same kind of muscle um, analogy just recently. I was like, I feel like someone who got mentally or intuitively out of shape. Yeah. And that, like, even like some of these editing exercises that I've done, where I made stuff that I don't know anything. I don't know exactly if it's good or not, or whatever. But it's like 
I just need to do this like as a workout routine. I yeah. need to start doing this you're again rusty. You're to rusty. rebuild these muscles. Yeah, you're rusty uh, and you need to get back you need to get your chops back. That's yeah. And that's a nece- that's a, again a necessary hurdle. And I think it's so funny, you know, I think maybe the reason that I I I described this uh in the order that I did where I kind of told the version first of, oh, I, these are obstacles that I should honor and, and, and actually turn away from is because for the last year and, or so, you know, I've been kind of, you know, uh, totally unmotivated and, and really just indulging in my kind of basest, you know, uh, desires, you know, just, Playing video games and you know watching porn and 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 watching movies and and doing things that require a little effort and 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 not really applying myself and not really like challenging myself and so I'm I'm constantly being faced with like these little these little reminders that it's like yeah okay if you really want to just sit here and waste away another day. You can, but you now you got to wait for it a little more, or or whatever, or, and so instead of instead of the more kind of positive spin on it, where it's like, no, you're 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 going to overcome this to accomplish something really worthwhile, and and the more important it is, the more people are going to try to get in the way of it, or things will try to get in the way of it, whatever form it may take. Um, so bring this back, if you don't mind, bring this back to the Erfenomen, right? The idea that this, the more, uh, I'm trying to find this line, the smaller the object, the more likely it seems that it contains the most concentrated form everything else. So it's the small decisions, right? It's these, like, um, these, these whoops, little seeming gestures of, yeah, you decided to take the day, but like, you know what, I could spend the next hour jerking off watching some just watch some shit and whatever or playing a game or whatever right you know so basically the same same thing absolutely and, and then it's like oh but you know what you might have, now you have to wait because this work came up or the baby woke up or whatever it is and now suddenly that free hour is not available when you want it right and you, it, it might again for me like my my work week is like pretty intense and then I get two days off and right. it's like during that work week how much time am I really finding especially if you're you know, trying to have any kind of social life or whatever it is, um, and so just just this idea of like, oh, if I don't take advantage of this right now, I have to wait for it to come back around. Right. And um, time management. I mean, that's the yeah. most simple way of putting it. But um, actually, I hate to interrupt this because. I'm immensely enjoying it, but you bring up a point about the baby. And I'm getting texted by my wife. Um, you said you had about three hours. Uh, so I will have at this point. I have maybe like the next forty minutes. Okay. Um, I have. I mean, if I if I don't want to get, you know, the stink eye and the cold shoulder. I need to give my daughter a bath in 25 minutes and then have dinner in 40 minutes. So do we want to gotcha. just, um, can, should I tell her that? I mean, I don't have to. I can say, no, I'm going to stay here, but that's going to. No, no, no. I, I think that's not great be... timing because like, I, need, I need to get on. I, I've, like, I've been doing this, but I, 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 I do have a kind of cutoff here. There's some stuff I need to do. So if you ever give her a bath in 20 minutes, let's have it with Tell your wife, cool, you'll be there in 20 minutes. Let's kind of wrap this up, focus on what we're doing. and uh, Great. Let me just let her know. Okay. Good. Uh, now I can... Let me just make sure my, my work... Okay, everything's good. So, uh, if there's a specific thing you want to focus on here, uh, feel free. I just want to ask, or, or, or throw this into the mix as one of the things we could discuss. Since this is episode 173, a number that's meaningful to me, I was curious, what does that number mean to you? Oh, okay. Well, um, well, let's see. I'm going to try to keep this succinct. But, um, well, first of all, like, uh, in a larger sense, I think that 
when you take something like a, a set of numbers or a set of letters, it doesn't like the order that they are in is is only one iteration of many possible things like the idea of an anagram like i believe that you know all of the potential anagrams of a, of a word or a phrase are are just as valid as the source that whatever phrase that you're starting with they're all they're all rel they're all kind of intimately connected so rearranging those numbers to me or deriving other or adding them together or any process that you can like any process that you can apply to a chunk of information to turn it into something else or something that you derive meaning from they're all equal they're all game as far as i'm concerned so on that note um well first of all oh, can, can i can i yeah. just can I address that real quick yeah. to say um um, for the most part, I agree with that statement. That uh, so they're certainly all on the table. Uh, I yeah. do like to make the distinctions, though. Like again, when you go back to the erfenomen or the, the the acorn or whatever the fuck analogy we want to use, right? So you can find the archetypal source code or the the the, the, the most reduction of it. But then the, I also think that there are very so like a, a stupid thing to say like we tell like solar mythology or something, and people are like oh. Christ is a sun god, and Ra is a sun god, and Horus is a sun god, and Apollo is a sun... You know, it's like, oh, so you just say solar deity, boom. So, you know, throw them all in the same bucket. But we should make the distinction, that even within Egyptian mythology, there's a, that Horus and Ra are two different figures with different attributes and sort of uh, personalities Absolutely. and whatever. And I, and I just like to I just like to make this point that, like, we... I, I sort of... I feel like... You need to keep both in your mind at the same time. You keep yeah. The archetypal, right? Erfenomen, the unit, the, the the essential commonality in one part of your brain, while keeping the uh, the potential the variations, of those combinations, yes. distinctions. Well, it's like quantum. Identity. It's like this kind. It's like this kind of metaphorical quantum state, right? Like yes. There's yes. the there's the version that it's you may a, be yes, observing. It's the wave and the part at the same time. Precisely. Right. And there's the version that you may be observing in a particular context, at a particular mm -hmm. moment, at a particular place, wherever, by a particular observer. And then there are all of the potential variations that coexist, that coexist but it's, it's kind of like not until that moment of observation that they're arranged in a particular order, like 173, for example, versus 317 or... 731 or 713 whatever okay yeah, so absolutely cool we're on the same page Got and it. and another little quick aside i want to make is personally uh i i draw a very clear distinction between uh numerals as as in the symbols that we use to assign or to represent quantities so numerals versus quantities which uh, i think are two very different things and speaking of, you know, you brought up Marty Leeds uh, a while ago, and that was, I, I, it was a question that he never answered. I was like, how, like, how do you break this distinction down between numerals and, and, and raw quantity, which I believe is... Is like signifier and signified, or well, perhaps, or, or just I think, that they are two separate things? In the, in the way that we say, and that, that many people say that mathematics is the purest kind of expression of reality... And, mm -hmm. and numbers kind of exist in, in uh, outside of human experience or whatever. They're just this quantities exist. To me, I, I, I feel like uh, it's because we rely on numerals and symbols so much to actually communicate about quantities, we forget that they are merely these pictures that we use to represent the idea of a quantity, mm -hmm. right? And so to me, I see... Um, which is why I, I am a little, I mean, I acknowledge that like something like numerology, for example, is, is full of interesting information, but I think, uh, far too often people derive like absolute meaning from a number versus, uh, the sim the, the symbol that a number represents. Like to me, like when I see numbers, I almost always translate them into letters or letters that they could potentially resemble because I feel like. We were talking with, and uh, you know, we were. Um, well, anyway. Like three one seven is an upside down lie. Yes, 
that's that's one. But three one seven also, and this is something that Guillaume and us talked about at one point, and he and I talked about a few days ago on three seventeen, is that if you draw your seven European style with the line through the with a little hash mark through the bottom sure, stroke. As I do actually. Yeah, me too. It's it's also spells elf, E L F. Oh. Which yes. is, which is also the German word for the number eleven, which has its own very you know loaded meaning in it as well. Uh, but we don't need to dwell on that. So, okay, I mentioned earlier that I had my very first kind of uh, very powerful, whatever you want to call it, experience in two thousand two. Uh, a, a, a psychiatrist would call it a psychotic episode, um, but it was what it was. And there was looking, you know, the weeks and months after that happened, I always associated um, the date July the 12th with the day that I kind of broke or, or just like really just went over the edge and uh and so 712 for a long 712 for me was for many years was a significant set of numbers um and ironically i met my wife on july 12th uh 7 years later and uh her but then but her birthday is Jan, is july 14th 714 um and and then I started kind of just looking at 710, 711, 712, 713, 714, um, et cetera. And, uh, you know, especially that range right there uh, between 710 and 714. Uh, and my, my area code growing up, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and the original when we still had one area code was 713. Um, and uh, I won't say, I won't give specifics, but some form of 713 is also in my social security number. So all of this just kind of seemingly trivial kind of metadata of my, of who I am. Hey, so just out of curiosity, what is your social security and credit card number? Is there any numerological significance? <laughs> well, I could go into a, that's a, <laughs> dude, actually, like, I, I would I could blow your mind if I could show I could show you, but I won't get into that now. But I, that's that's we should try to talk again soon. I can explain in more detail uh, some really freaky shit that I discovered in my social security number. Um, but getting back to it, so but ultimately, I did center on kind of this the average of these values between seven ten, which is like oil. OIL if you flip over 710, right? Um, and if you're in France, you would pronounce that wall, like they pronounce, or, or, or that could be one way to, to articulate those, the letters OIL. And I used to be called wall, like short for Wally or Walter. And uh, so a lot of this stuff, I mean, and a lot of my interest in all of these things all stemmed from just me as a kid before I had any awareness of these types of ideas or thinking, it's just, oh, hey, somebody's got my initials on their license plate. Or, hey, that's my birthday in, in this little stream of numbers that is your phone number. Just this little crap. I mean, the stuff, the, the most basic metadata that we carry with us that's part of who we are, to me, is the most recognizable patterns that you start picking up on is because they're so ingrained in you from, from the moment you can start even you know, understanding what those mean, like your birthday or your address, like these little things that you've memorized and you see them in other places and you're like, oh, hey, look at that. Isn't that interesting? You know, and then so. So I look at the number seven or three, one, seven or one, three, seven, which or one, seven, three, one, three, seven is actually you can look up the number one, three, seven in Wikipedia. And it's a number that Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung obsessed over as having some kind of... Uh, Abs absolutely. Uh, if you go back to Always Record episode 101... Uh-huh. Um, uh, there's a... Uh, what's his name? Fuck, I'm drawing a blank. 
go, go to, someone go to Always Record, episode 101, and we had on, uh, uh, actually, Wolfgang Pauli's, uh, like, a understudy uh, and, and an essential collaborate, an eventual like collaborator. An apprentice, kind uh, of? And um, he told a story, he, he goes deep into the story of how this number became so significant that it even shows up like when he goes to the hospital and he's in room like 137 in his hospital bed as an older man he's like i'm gonna die here i already know this right because this is the number right well okay and look look like the word kabbalah this is what's uh, also really interesting is when you start taking gematria and use apply gematria to the stuff of gematria. So like the word kabbalah itself has a gematria value of 137 Okay, and, uh, and quantum physics one divided by thirty-seven, all this sort of stuff. And yeah, there's this weird recurring palindromic uh, uh, d decimal value, right? Or the the golden ratio is approximately one hundred and thirty-seven degrees, um, and or the golden angle. I'm sorry, uh, I mean, um, and uh, yeah, so there's that, <clears throat> um, but also like, I mean, to me, the number three. Is 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 really if we were going to break it down, and um, you know, the number three is very significant. Almost, I think, in many ways, the most significant numeral, but also quantity. To get back to my distinction there, the number three, in terms of the way I like to think about things, is the mo it's it's very polygrammatical. Like, depending on your point of view, the number three can resemble uh, on every on every axis. You could the number three could be the letter M. It could be the letter E. It could be the letter W. When paired with the number one, like in 137, you could, I mean, sometimes when I write the capital letter B, I accidentally write the number 13, really. I draw a single line and then the two little hoops of the B. But I, I for whatever, because my handwriting sucks, I don't connect them and it looks like the number one, three, right? And then if you break it down into the number one, 13 and seven, those are two of the most kind of super popularly superstitious numbers. In our in in our in Western culture, seven and thirteen, right? Um, if you add them all up, you get the number eleven again. You know, uh, which is packed full of interesting stuff that I could that will require a whole individual episode for me to talk about. Um, uh, and then, yeah, there are the words that you can spell with it, like the word lie, uh, the word elf. Um, the word uh, wit, if you turn the seven into a letter T and you turn the letter three into a letter W, W-I-T, um, or bit, if you, or just the letters B and T. Because like in the, in lead speak, which is the whole kind of hacker way of writing where they use numbers instead of letters, um, the, le the number seven represents the letter T. So, or you've got the, the word let, L-E-T, um, and, you know, these are, these seem like tiny and significant words, but getting back to my very early point, they're, they're, they're so small and so kind of, uh, uh, there's so much potential in ways in which they can be used. You go to the fucking, you go to Wiktionary, you look up the word let, and it is a massive page of 15 different languages that, and like 20 different, just in English alone, there's, there's. Now, under one etymology, there's seven definitions. Under the next etymology, there's five definitions, you know. Um, and, the, you know, I mean, there, it's just, like, it just goes on and on. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I, could, I could sit down and prepare a more comprehensive, exp you know, uh, uh, just list of, of all of the ways in which I find significance in this number and come back to you with it. But just off the top of my head, I was able to, to rap about it for five or 10 minutes, you know, I'm sure you have much more to add. Oh yeah. I mean, so, uh, but, uh, you know, we mentioned Zanor a few times he did on his blog, he did, uh, like one article about 137. He did another article about 713 and he did another article about 317. Like, he went through those different permutations and did something on, on each of those, um, or at least discussed all of them. Uh, I did uh, uh, three, so I'll make this super quick, uh, is that when um, 317 was such a 
big thing for me. It's the, I, I did a video about it. Yeah, I remember. Um, so yep. Sync quick news. Yep. I don't know what episode it was, but it's one about, about St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day, Day, which is huge. And um, whatever, like I've, I've just I've I've been obsessed with the number three seventeen for a number of years. Uh, it was the day. Oh, it's one thirty seven p.m. right now. Oh. Uh, uh, it was um, it was the day I had my contacts experience, for lack of a better term, when uh, David Bowie appeared to me in a dream. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's a series of things. And it was interesting how you said you ended with this window between seven one zero and seven one four because I came up with this uh, window between three one three and three one seven. Oh. Um, and that was this uh, in the Egyptian calendar. There, it's interesting they have these five days. So like, like the original calendar was like three hundred and sixty days, and then as they sort of modified to a three hundred and sixty-five day more accurate uh, assessment. Part of that they sort of write off as that there's these five kind of days out of time, and they come with this mythology for what these five special days are, and that's when all the gods are born because like there was some curse that the gods couldn't be born on the calendar, something something. So there's these five days that exist out of time, and I associated that with March 13th, March 14th, March 15th, March 16th, March 17th. Whatever, that's me. That's just like my own little personal mythology I'm building in my head, right? Mm -hmm. But fucking um, 317 is what I associated with this King Kill, Osiris. The, the, I was writing this book, uh, Suicide Kings, which was all about that. JFK and 317 and Osiris and all this sort of shit, right? And for and I didn't want to see the artwork I had done for the book cover to Suicide Kings as uh, this... Um, specific drawing from an old medical encyclopedia and I used the, the coin the, the, the half dollar with JFK's head and um, on March 14th I walked into, I met this guy here in town and he owns a record shop cool ass fucking record shop um, oh it's funny the record shop is called Wax Moon and the Egyptian mythology of those five days has to do with uh, whatever, it has to do with basically like uh, Thoth and the moon getting into like a bet and like for like like literally like gambling for five like for time out of the calendar whatever whatever it's a long story so uh, I go in there and he's got this like poster of some band hanging up using that same old drawing from a medical encyclopedia that I've never seen anywhere else so I'm just like oh that's interesting that was on like March 14th but the day before I'm at work I'm a waiter right I'm waiting on these tables blah 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 and it was like a slow ass fucking night or whatever and I hadn't really put any thought into the whole fact that it was March 13th. Uh, 313, by the way, is the in the Zapruder film is when JFK gets shot. The head shot is 313. Um, like you, you, it's actually like you know you can watch the Zapruder film. It's, there's numbered frames. So JFK gets his head shot. Boom, he's framed 313. Uh, uh, I'm working at this restaurant. On March 13th, this day that I thought would have significance, and I'm just sort of like getting back into all this shit, and I'm whatever, and I'm sort of not really thinking about it, but like, I see like this table gets up, and I'm clearing the table, and like in the like fold of the seat where these people were sitting, I see this little like piece of gold something shiny, mm -hmm. and I'm like, what the fuck is that? And I bend over, and I pull this thing out, and it's this little, you know those chocolate coins with the gold foil? Yep. It was a chocolate coin of JFK's fucking head. Wow. Right? And I'm just standing in this restaurant, and I, I cannot kid you, like, I had to hold back tears. Wow. Because it was this, um, it was sort of this, like, very literal, like, this thing that was so hugely significant to me that I would kind of put aside, that I had whatever... And as I started sort to reintegrate with it, it was sort of like, yeah, asshole, this shit's fucking real and still here. Yeah. And that was the, like, it was like, you know, this day that I associated uh, with JFK, I fucking just end up with this, like, boom, here's a fucking coin with his head on it that you used on your book cover. The next day I go and I see a different part of the book cover in the record shop. And the next day I was like, this is fucking crazy. It's 
fucking crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. And it's wonderful. It's beautiful. And it was this great reminder that, yes, we need to be grounded in a certain amount of rationality. But I'd be damned if there isn't some real phenomenon going on here. Um, you know, in other words, what profoundly fascinated Benjamin from the beginning was never an idea. It was always a phenomenon. Yep. There is something something happening that I can't deny. And it's like, anytime I try and deny it, it smacks me in the face with some hyper literal, like actual transcendental object that shows up in my life. Like, yep. oh yeah, here's a fucking coin, you know? Right. Put that in your fucking pipe and smoke it.